It's difficult to imagine Formula One without Mercedes. The German manufacturer has been a vital part of the sport, witnessing some of the most breathtaking moments, intense championship battles, and innovative car designs. However, its involvement in Formula One has not been continuous, with one particularly heinous incident serving as the impetus for an over five-decade absence from the hectic world of Formula One. In this video, we'll go back in time to the most influential motor racing accident in history, how it shaped the future of car racing, and why it caused Mercedes to withdraw from racing and Formula One. They came in droves. If the skies hadn't been so clear that day, perhaps some of them would have stayed at home and the stands would have been less crowded. However, the sun shone brightly, and a large crowd of between 250,000 and 300,000 gathered in Le Mans on June 11, 1955, to witness one of the most eagerly anticipated events on the motor racing calendar. The grid for the Le Mans 24-hour race was truly spectacular. It featured not only drivers of the caliber of Juan Manuel Fangio, Sterling Moss, and Mike Hawthorne, but also three manufacturers at the pinnacle of their abilities. Ferrari was the reigning Le Mans champion, while Jaguar had thrown everything they had at winning the race and regaining the title they had held two years prior. Mercedes-Benz, on the other hand, had high hopes for its new 300 SLR, which featured an ultra-lightweight magnesium alloy body and was piloted by Fangio and Maas. The race's early stages did not disappoint, despite the fact that the race is traditionally an endurance event both Jaguar and Mercedes appeared to be treating it more like a sprint, with Fangio and Hawthorne repeatedly exchanging lap records. Following the death of a close relative during World War II, Hawthorne's open hostility toward the German manufacturer only added his determination to crush the Mercedes challenge. But on the 35th lap in the third hour of the race, disaster struck. In a fierce battle with Fangio, Hawthorne passed British driver Lance Macklin's Austin Healey, before realizing he was being called into the pits. He swerved across the track, braking hard. Macklin took evasive action, veering to the right before returning to the track and into the path of Mercedes driver Pierre Levesque. The Frenchman had no time to react to 150 miles per hour, and his front wheel ended up on the back of Macklin's car. Levesque's Mercedes was catapulted off the track, launched into the air, and was obliterated after colliding with an embankment. Levesque, meanwhile, was thrown back onto the track, the sheer force of the impact killing him instantly. Debris from his car, including the engine block, flew into the crowd. His bonnet lid slashed through the crowd for 100 meters. We don't need to describe what happened to them. The back of the car burst into flames, and the magnesium alloy's blindingly white light only added to the intensity of the flames. Carnage reigned supreme. In addition to Levesque, 83 bystanders were killed, and hundreds more were injured. Hawthorne, who had missed the pits, arrived a lap later, tears streaming down his face. People in the stands carried the injured and the dead on advertising banners, while others frantically searched for loved ones. Though Lance Macklin's testimony at a judicial inquest days later was often vague and imprecise, the passage of time has sharpened his memory of the accident. The following is his account of the moment after his car was hit. It's a most extraordinary sensation. Everything slows right down, as if you were watching a slow-motion film. Your brain acts so fast you can see everything, and I can remember as I was spinning I saw the timekeepers watching me from their booth. As I was rolling along backward, I saw Levesque's car following me in the air, with Levesque sort of hunched over in the cockpit. I felt the heat of his exhaust as he went by me, no more than three feet over my shoulder. Then there was a hell of a bang, like a bomb had hit. However, for some inexplicable reason, the race continued. American Formula One driver John Fitch, who was Levesque's co-driver and was standing next to the Frenchman's wife at the time of the accident, urged Mercedes to withdraw from the race. He argued that for a German manufacturer to be seen as indifferent to French bloodshed would be disastrous just as a decade after Europe's guns had fallen silent. However, the decision had to be made at the highest level and permission to withdraw from the race was only granted after all of the company directors had been contacted and given their approval, which occurred around midnight. The remaining Mercedes cars were quietly pulled from the race at 1.45 a.m., when the crowd was at its thinnest. At the time, they were first and third. The significance of the 1955 Le Mans 24-hour race cannot be overstated. The death toll prompted an immediate temporary ban on motorsports in France, Spain, 
Switzerland, West Germany, and other countries until racetracks could be made safer. While most countries lifted their bans relatively quickly, Switzerland's ban remains in place to this day, with the exception of electric vehicles. However, in addition to the human costs of those who died and were injured that day, some bore scars that were not visible from the outside. A board of inquiry cleared Mike Hawthorne of any wrongdoing in the disaster. The Brit is remembered as one of the last of the burn the candle at both ends drivers, an all-night party-goer who could step into a car and drive with the best of them the next afternoon. Yet the 1955 Le Mans race never left him. Shortly before he died in a car accident, he wrote of the race, It was as though we were at the point where a great rock had been hurled into a pond, sending out waves of shock and horror and indignation which would later flow back bringing consequences which no one could foresee. Pressure from the media and the subsequent PR disaster also forced Mercedes to withdraw from motorsports entirely, including Formula One. You may already have an idea of how significant that was for racing at the time. After all, if the same thing happened today, it would have global ramifications for the whole sport. And 1955 was no exception. That year, Mercedes-Benz dominated both the prestigious Grand Prix races and the demanding long-distance races, with the motorsport department finishing the season with a suitably impressive haul of titles. While Manuel Fangio won the Formula One World Championship, and Mercedes-Benz won the Constructors' Championship in the sports car category with the 300 SLR. The Stuttgart-based company also won the European Touring Car Championship and the Italian and American sports car championships. No other manufacturer had ever had such a stranglehold on the various disciplines and classes of car racing, from Formula One to diesel sedan competition. Nonetheless, the Le Mans disaster overshadowed the entire season. It could have been a satisfactory year for Mercedes. Alfred Neubauer, racing manager of the Mercedes-Benz Grand Prix team, later wrote of the 1955 season. But Le Mans is what sticks in the memory. However, there were numerous other arguments against engaging in track-related activities. In fact, if the Le Mans tragedy never happened, Mercedes would still almost certainly have withdrawn from motorsport. The enormous costs involved, both in terms of car development and construction, as well as the race organization and coordination required to meet the company's own standards, were critical considerations. Indeed, Mercedes-Benz engineers and mechanics expertise were more urgently required in the development of new passenger cars. Board member Fritz Nallinger emphasized the point, When it comes to the further development of our product range, it is in our interest to allow these highly qualified people to focus exclusively on the area which is most important to our many customers around the world, namely the construction of series-produced vehicles, and they will also benefit, of course, from the knowledge and experience they have gained in the construction of racing cars. In any case, Mercedes-Benz had exited the world of motor racing with its head held high and at the pinnacle of its capabilities. The W196R Grand Prix cars had competed in seven races in 1955, winning six of them while finishing fifth in five others and third in one. Meanwhile, the 300 SLR racing sports car competed in six races, earning five Silver Arrow victories, five second places, and one third place. Mercedes-Benz could hardly have achieved greater domination. But after all, the era of the Silver Arrows gracing the world's top race tracks had come to an end, and Mercedes-Benz would not return to motorsports or Formula One for decades. As Alfred Neubauer recalled, it was a reflective farewell after a truly remarkable season. We shook each other's hands once again, and they went their separate ways. Fangio and Moss, Collins, Kling, Trophy, and Graf Trips. It was all over.